week, and Party Pooper Chuck answered it. Yes. <sighs> Every party has a pooper. That's why we invited Chuckle. Well, okay, we'll just go to Proverbs 29. Um, next week we'll be closing up with Proverbs, and we'll also be looking at a few other things. Um, but don't forget that we have the question box. If you have any questions uh, about not just what we've talked about, but things that we haven't talked about, things you'd like us to talk about, just anything that um, you have on your mind or, or anything like that, you just write it anonymously and put it into that box on the table, and we will look at it within usually within a month. Um, but yeah. So, Proverbs 29. And Proverbs 29 is really the last of the um, sayings of Solomon. And then in chapter 30, it's going to switch to a guy named Agur. Now, Agur is, is, this is the only place we know him from Scripture. Um, we don't really know anything about him. We don't know where he's from or anything like that. Um, and he has a lot of good things. We're going to look at that today. And then next week, uh, in chapter 31, there's uh, some words by a guy named King Lemuel. Now, we also don't know anything about him either. Um, and then the, that chapter closes up with the woman, uh, the exhortation about a, a wise woman. Um, so, Proverbs 29 says, He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. And uh, I kind of like the imagery here, you know, stiffening your neck, you know, and then being broken. You just kind of imagine the imagery of something being hard like a block of ice, and then you just throw it to the ground and it shatters. Um, but anyways, uh, everyone has problem areas, but the, the difference is, is what you do with those problem areas. See, as they come up in your, in your life, you're going to have options where people are going to point them out, or you're going to see them or whatever, and you're going to have the option to either uh, you know, roll with it and try to um, overcome it through the process of listening and that kind of stuff, or you're going to have the have the option of hardening your heart instead and saying, no, I like this. This is who I am. Uh, oftentimes when we get to that place of hardening, we, we do things to, to excuse it too. Like, uh, for instance, um, well, I read the Bible differently than you read the Bible. Or we say, well, it's not wrong for me, I don't think. Or we say, I've been doing it for years, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Or we say, um, you know, things like that, where we try to kind of excuse it and uh, allow ourselves to continue with the hardened heart. So, um, Gracie, do we have, uh, where's that other pillow for Diana? Um, oh, it's behind Zach. Zach, would you mind giving yeah. Diana that pillow? Oh. We ha you if you need a pillow, Zach, we've got another one. Oh, uh, oh. I didn't realize that I was there. Oh, Thank okay. You. Um, so listening does change things. <laughs> um, because notice how it says there, he who is often reproved, yet stiffens his neck. You know, um, there's a few things reprove. That's where people are, you know, trying to give you instruction. But then notice how he says often reproved. In other words, it may have started as you know somebody saying something or knowing something was in your heart or that kind of stuff. But then it became a place of being often reproved. So, if that guy drives by one more time, one more time. Have you guys seen? Do what? Throw something else. Have you guys seen on Malcolm in the Middle where the dad makes a speed bump on his road? <laughs> Anyways, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. And this is kind of repeated a couple different places in Proverbs, kind of the idea of, you know, um, wicked versus righteousness. Um, and the idea there, uh, when the wicked rule, when there's wicked people in, 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 in leadership, they oftentimes have a way of making life hell for people. Raising taxes, treating people unfairly, not, not acting with justice, you know, that kind of stuff. Um... Verse 3, he who loves wisdom makes his father glad, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. And really, there's a couple different things going on here. First off, there's a waste of resource. Okay, A companion of prostitutes. In other words, he spends all his money on, on hoes. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it squanders his wealth. And the idea here is, is, is really going to a lot of different places. First off, there's, there's the whole idea of bringing shame to your family. And then there's a whole idea about uh, mishandling uh, the wealth that your father stored. Nothing really chaps a father's hide like, you know, when he when he sets aside, you know, um, resources for his child, you know, uh, money or, or wealth or whatever to help them live a better life. And then they take that and just completely misuse it. I mean, it complete, I mean, you guys surely have seen this before. 
Um, a similar a similar thing happens when, when a father, you know, is very unwise with his with his money, and the kids have a similar feeling. I think, in my opinion, it's worse for a father to see the son do that because the father, as you get older, you kind of start to realize that you are immortal. <laughs> and so you want to leave something worth leaving to those who are after you. But then if they squander it, it's like, well, ah, no! You know, if you're a kid and, you're de and, you're, and your parents are acting foolish with money, it's like, you know, oh, well. Yeah, right. not the end of the world. But when it's when it's you and your kid, it's like, no! Right. So, anyways. Um, <clears throat> verse 4. By just as a king builds up the land, but he who exacts gifts tears it down. Now, now the idea there, exact gifts, it's uh, it can be kind of multiple things. First off, a bribe. Exacts yeah. gifts, you know. Um, so the idea is justice being blinded. Uh, the books of the law are, are completely full of, of stuff talking about this. But also there's the idea of raising taxes. Um, verse 5. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Now notice how he said um, flatter. Okay, He's talking more about manipulation, not encouragement. He's not saying saying good things and telling people, you know, encouraging people and being nice. He's not saying that's bad. He's talking about where you flatter people, you specifically try to manipulate them, try to, you know, uh, get something out of it for yourself. So a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. It's not going to go well. Uh, verse 6, an evil man is ensnared in his transgression, but a righteous man sings and rejoices. Obviously, you can see the, the role reversal there. Um, when we when we give ourselves over to a life of wickedness, we become entrapped by that. And we've looked at that over and over again, so I'm not really going to spend much time there. Uh, but then a righteous man sings and rejoices. He's carefree. He's not he's not entangled by things. He's he's uh, free. He's he's rejoicing. Verse seven: A righteous man knows the rights of the poor. A wicked man does not understand such knowledge. See, wicked people are are completely oblivious, completely oblivious to things like justice. Um, verse. In fact, not not. Rarely, not rarely, so frequently, <laughs> uh, you see people who are, let's just say, overly business-minded, um, taking advantage of the poor people, and saying things like, well, they should have managed their money better. You know what I mean? You, it's very, very common to hear, hear people talk like that, without without compassion and mercy and those kinds of things. Um, really kind of a, a mark there. Scoffers set a city aflame, but the wise turn away wrath. Now, obviously, he's not really talking about setting the city on fire. You know, <laughs> he's talking about stirring up strife. He sets it ablaze in the, in the sense of he makes everybody mad. You know, scoffers, you know, foolish people, uh, people who, what's a good word for a scoff? Um, uh, insulters, uh, no. Uh, uh, kind of complainers, um, kind of. Um, do what? Naggers, yeah. Jack, can you look up a dictionary definition? <laughs> it's gonna bug me if I if I don't. Uh, a mocker. Okay, mocker. There's a good word. Um, mockers set a, set a sea of flame because not everybody knows what the word scoffer means. I mean, people don't really use that word anymore. We we use mock, we use that word, but scoff. I mean, not really that common. Um, so, uh, but the wise turn away wrath. So the idea that, that, that God's people, God's righteous people, are called to be peacemakers, and Jesus talks about this in great. In great deal. In fact, I would I would advise you now that we've uh, getting through Proverbs. I would advise you to read the Gospel of Matthew, where you can really see um, Matthew's purpose in showing Jesus as a wise teacher. Um, Matthew plays a lot on the book of Proverbs on Jesus as just a wise person in general. Um, Matthew is broken up, I believe, into five different. Uh, uh, teachings of Jesus, you know, uh, sermons. The Sermon on the Mount, and he has another one a couple of chapters later. There's five of them in total throughout Matthew um, to really show Jesus as a, as a teacher, as, you know. Uh, verse, um, let's see, nine here. If a wise man has an argument with a fool, the fool only rages and laughs, and there is no quiet. Have you guys ever argued with somebody like that? Don't listen to a word you say. And they turn it back on you. It's all your fault anyways. And they just go on and on and on. It's like, okay, enough. Never mind. And the idea here is don't, not, not only, not only don't, don't bother wasting your time arguing with a fool, but also don't associate with fools. You know, it's kind of, 
once again implied there. He talks about it specifically elsewhere. So you know, um, <clears throat> verse ten: Bloodthirsty men hate one who is blameless and seek the life of the upright. Um, and that's going to be something that's going to be repeated again here in a little bit. So watch out for that. Um, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Have you ever just wanted to go to somebody and vent? Just, yeah. just get something off your chest. Yeah. Yeah. I do that. I like I like doing that personally because, especially when it's someone trusted, because I feel like <sighs> I thought I was going to explode there. Right. A fool gives full vent to his spirit. Ah. <sighs> 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 And, and really, the idea, it, it, there's there's many reasons why it's why it's foolish to do this. First off, because it's not it's not gonna it's not it's nothing that needs to be said. And a wise person is always careful that the things that they say are few words and wise words when they do speak. So there's that. But then also there's a chance that somebody else will hear you. There's a chance that the person you're talking to won't sympathize with you. That's actually a proverb that we're gonna get to in a minute here. Um, and th there's a chance that you know it could backfire on you. Um, there's a chance that it could stir up bad feelings in the other person. You, you'd be guilty of their bad attitude, too. So there's just a lot of different things that can happen there. But a wise man quietly holds it back. So what do you do when you feel like you're just going to burst? Well, that's for a different day. <laughs> do what? I did. Hold it back. <laughs> you, uh, I burned inside. <laughs> wait until you get an ulcer like Malcolm did. <laughs> Do you guys remember that episode of Malcolm in the Middle where uh, he keeps keep he keeps you know keeping biting his snide his comments to his yeah biting his tongue, and uh, then finally ends up getting an ulcer because he's been keeping his snide. <laughs> <laughs> that one really was funny, <laughs> but I will say this: if you just let the attitude that if you let the attitude that wanted to vent remain in your spirit, it's not gonna do good. Does that make sense? Yeah. And once again, we all have moments of wanting to vent. So, you know, it's not like Diana. You know, we all have these moments like this. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, when when we see that, that this and we try and we try and hold it back, we try to fight that attitude, we try and grow past it, that's what wise people do. It's not that wise people don't have problems. It's that wise people face their problems. Whereas a fool just denies their existence. I'm fine. Everything's fine. I don't have a problem. You have a problem. Oh. It's like, well... Okay. <laughs> you know, there's a problem when you got nobody to vent at. <laughs> I mean, you know, Are you saying you're mad at Gracie? <laughs> just kidding. I'm just no. kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, Diana told me this story one time that made me laugh so hard. I still, it still makes me laugh. And I'm going to tell it anyways. Uh, I didn't ask if I could. I'm just going to tell <laughs> uh, She was saying that one time Joe did something and she got mad at Joe. But then Joe apologized for doing it. And she said, I got so mad because I couldn't yell at him anymore because he apologized. <laughs> I was like, and So then I told her, I said, well, do what I do. Pretend like you didn't hear it and just keep nagging them. <laughs> Make them apologize a few times. <laughs> but anyways, um, verse 12. If a ruler listens to falsehood, all his officials will be wicked. See what he said there? If a ruler listens to falsehood, it's, it's going to eventually rub off, and he's going to have the people it, up there with him are going to be wicked people. Which is why I'm so happy, so relieved that Hillary Clinton did not become the president. Because she would have put a bunch of wicked people in there with her. See what I mean? Trump is an idiot. But yeah. Hillary Clinton, I mean, she's just straight up evil. You know what I mean? There, there's there's Quilla Deville, <laughs> okay, and then there's just you know the the bear from Jungle Book. You know that's Trump. You know he's just going on his way. He's just oblivious to what's going on. You know, and that's not necessarily you know. Well, I'll leave it at that. Um, verse thirteen. Um, the poor man. Now, when, now I do want to kind of clarify that because this is being recorded. Um, I support Trump as a president. I think everybody should, especially if you call yourself a Christian. I pray for Trump. Um, when I call him an idiot, I'm more saying he doesn't know how to close his mouth. That's more of what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. So, um, anyways, the poor man and the oppressor meet together. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. Now, what this means gives light, he creates, or gives light, he creates. Have you, have you ever seen somebody dead? There's just that look in their eyes gone. It's just kind of a glossed over look. It's dead eyes, you know. In fact, because of 
how people's eyes look when they're dead. Uh, people oftentimes uh, use dead eyes for for people who just are emotionless. They've got dead eyes, you know. Uh, so, anyways, um, and so the idea here is that God made both those people. This is another part in Proverbs where, where we're faced with something that seems illogical. So God created the poor person. Why didn't he give them wealth? God created the oppressor. Why didn't he take them out for oppressing people? Say what I mean? We're faced with this conundrum of it saying, yes, God is responsible for their creation. Just as God is responsible for the creation of Satan. But yet it doesn't answer the question, but why? You know, it never answers that. So, <coughs> verse uh, 14. Uh, are there any questions so far? Okay, cool. If a king faithfully judges the poor, his throne will be established forever. Now, throughout the Bible, um, it will frequently use the word forever. This doesn't mean for all time, okay? Especially in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, it can mean forever, or, or I mean for all time as we think of it today. But mostly it means um, uh, continually or um, um, in perpetuity. Uh, you know, it, something that, that is an ongoing thing, basically. Um, so, like, when um, when God tells Israel in the book of the law, do this forever. He didn't mean continue doing it even after Jesus comes. He didn't mean that. He meant do it continually year, year, year throughout year. I thought he meant uh, as long as the... or as long as he lives. Well... Yes, but it goes deeper than that. The idea here is that God will extend his reign. Right. See what I mean? Uh, and will cause him to live longer. But it's in his turn, right? In, in whose? In God's? No, in, in, in uh, whoever is on the king. Um, as a typical rule, yes. However, I do want to add an addendum. There are plenty of righteous people who have died early that were, that were good rulers that, that just died early. You know, so I do want to kind of preface that with that. But yes, that is exactly what he's saying. Typically speaking, that person uh, will it will be for that person. Yes. Um, however, God also I do want to add this. God does also specify that when somebody is righteous, um, God will bless their kids after them. So it goes extends beyond just them too. So, uh, anyways, uh, verse. Uh, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, verse fifteen here. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Now, it's not saying beat it out of them. Well, if you see your kid doing something, you beat it out of them. That's not what he's saying at all. See, nowadays we think of that because a lot of pastors have said that. That's not what he's saying. You have to try and understand what he's saying back then. What he's saying is if you faithfully discipline your children, you will teach them things about how to act and how not to act that will last them their whole life. Now remember, in Hebrew thought, discipline isn't be, isn't just beating like we think of today. Discipline is bad nowadays, but the biblical idea of discipline isn't bad. It in, it includes instructing someone, telling them what to do, encouraging them for doing the right thing, uh, verbally telling them not to do the, do the wrong thing, as well as physical discipline. Okay, so there's there it kind of is an umbrella term, and when we think of discipline nowadays, we just think of somebody abusing their child. And that's not, we, not the biblical idea. Um, <clears throat> so, when the wicked increase, transgression increases, but the righteous will look upon their downfall. Now, I do want to say something before I go to the note on this one. Um, some of God's laws seem a little bit severe. But, when the law is followed, it discourages other people from disobeying the law. See what I mean? Whereas when the law is not, when pe when too much grace is given by by ju by judges, other people will fall in suit and also act immorally. For instance, the first ca the first case at Lakers last year, the year before, where that guy uh, raped that that high schooler raped that girl. Um, you know, well then the judge went lenient on him, and there were like five more cases that year. I should say five more cases that were publicized that year. Five more big cases that everybody heard about. You know, and it's like, well, why? And in each one, the judge was leaning on them. See what I mean? Whereas God, God even says this in his law, so that people will not 
will not follow in suit, and by that, evil will be purged from the land. There are some people who would not have been evil had the law been used for its purpose. See what I mean? There are some things that would not have happened if the law would have simply been instructed. Now remember, mercy is for us to give people. It's not, mercy doesn't overtake justice. The legal system says to operate as a legal system. See what I mean? When somebody murders someone, we should hope, and you know, we should pray, and we should do whatever is necessary that, that, that they will find God through the process. However, the law is still the law. Does that make sense? If you read through the books of the law of Moses, you'll notice that there's not a whole lot of, not of room for mercy in there. If this person does this, put them to death. If this person does this, do this. See what I mean? It's not like, not, not a whole lot of leeway there. In fact, Paul taps into this in, I think it's 1 Corinthians, and he says, um, discipline this person so that the rest may see and fear. The book of Acts touches on this. When, the, when Ananias and Sapphira tried to lie to, I think it was Peter, about how much she sold their property for. Um, and it says that the Holy Spirit killed them. And then it says, and the rest saw and were afraid. So there's this idea that when the law is actually utilized, it keeps other people from, from, from following in suit. Which is why you see a lot of uh, drunk drivers in, Albuquerque, in New Mexico. Because drunk drivers can get caught 50 different times for drinking drunk, and they can still get away with it. The legal system in New Mexico is a joke, but that's a conversation for another day. Uh, when the wicked increase, transgression increase. You know what, I tell you what, I'd like to see some godly people get raised up and, and start working in the New Mexico government. Because I'm about tired of all these corrupt people we keep getting in there. People who don't care about stuff. You know, the judges and stuff like that, that are just wicked people. Letting things go as they are. We have police officers getting discouraged and leaving the force because they keep trying to do things to enact justice only to have the people put back out on the street. Yeah. Well, that's not a very good incentive to, for doing for doing the right thing, though, is it? <laughs> so anyways, um, if you have a... Have a dream of, of pursuing that. You know, that's something worth pursuing, you guys. Uh, when the wicked increase, transgression increases, but the righteous will look upon their downfall. They will outlast it. And the idea there is that the righteous must prevail. Prevail in doing right. You don't do right because everybody else is doing it. You do right, especially in the sight and in, 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 at that place of, of uh, the abundance of wickedness. Because we don't know when we will see, the, see righteousness persevere, but we know that it will come. Um. <coughs> Verse 17. Discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. Now this is not talking about a one-time event. He's not. It, it don't see discipline as a quick solution, but an ongoing molding. Discipline is an ongoing process that you do with your children. An ongoing thing. Now the problem is a lot of times parents don't see their changing role. When your child is a child... You get them spankings and those kinds of things. But as they grow, you stop giving spankings and you do other things. But then as they become an adult, you stop disciplining them. Instead, you give them instruction. See what I mean? And so your role changes throughout the years. And, and the things that you do changes throughout the years. A as a parent, you shouldn't be still spanking your child when they're like 17 or 18 years old. Like, there's a time when, okay, that's, that's enough. You know what I mean? Like, time to switch methods. And... Uh, that's not something that you get to choose. That's something that God set in time by the child growing. That's why he only gave us so much time with our kids, because, you know, they have to go and be their own person. They have to make their own decisions. So if we fail as parents uh, to discipline, then it's on us. But if we did what we were supposed to do, and the child just disobeys and is stubborn, well, then it's not on us anymore. Um, anyways, uh... Verse 18, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Now, there's actually a couple different ideas with this verse. Some people want to try and change it to where there is no guidance, uh, uh, people cast off restraint. Just because there's um, a few different, and I talked about this last week, there's a few different parts uh, in Proverbs especially, uh, where it's just kind of hard to understand what the Hebrew is saying. Um, but for all intents and purposes, I think that uh, this is, we should just stick with this reading. For there is where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. And the idea here is, is pretty simple. Um, distance from God leads to anarchy. When a people start rejecting God, when a people start pushing away from the prophetic, what does it say there? People cast off restraint. There, there's anarchy. People just do whatever they want in their own eyes. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Contrasting there, the difference between the lawless person uh, and the person who obeys uh, the law. 
Verse 19, by mere words a servant is not disciplined, but for though he understands, he will not respond. And the idea of response here means he will not um, um, he will not do what you're telling him to do. So there's a broader principle that you can't nag people into doing better. Have you ever tried to nag your kids and give them a, a, the longest lecture in the world to try to get them to do the right thing? It doesn't work. Someone tried to nag their spouse. People, yeah. people try to nag their spouses. Um, or a spouse. <laughs> um, so there's that. By mere words, a servant is not disciplined. So you're gonna have to, yeah, you're gonna have to do more than that. Now, at the time, and the, the idea that I work with them, at the time, it was common to uh, discipline a servant. Discipline in the sense of, like you would a child. Right. Okay. The rod. Discipline, you know, that kind of sense. Um, obviously, times have changed, but at that time, it was a common practice of the culture. So, rather than rather than telling us whether that was right or wrong, he's just simply saying um, the, 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 the good use of it. How that translates to today is you can't simply tell someone who's, who's not getting it. You can't. You can't just simply use a bunch of words and they'll suddenly get it. You have to work with them. You have to show them. You have to train them. See what I mean? Um, but anyways, uh, slavery and that kind of stuff is a discussion for another day as it applies to Israel. So I'll just leave it there. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Whoever pampers his servant from childhood will in the end find him his heir. Now this is a little bit confusing because it has multiple translations. Uh, some of your translations might say something along the lines of whoever pampers his servant from childhood will in the end find uh, find grief. Does anybody have that translation? Grief. We'll bring grief. Okay. You have that? Okay. Does anybody else have something like that? Who has? Nobody else has grief in their translations. No. Okay. Um, really. It could go either way here, and that's that's where the... In fact, if you have the ESV, it says there in the footnote, the meaning of the Hebrew word rendered his heir is, un, excuse me, is uncertain. And that's pretty accurate, it's uncertain, and people go back and forth. Um, it could go either way, so let's look at both of them. Um, if it is, uh, uh, whoever pampers a servant from childhood will in the end find him, uh, uh, will in the end find grief. Uh, it's more saying, um, if you don't, discipline the servant it's not going to go well they're not going to learn how to work they're not going to learn how to do the things that you that you want them to do if it's error it's more saying working with the servant will bring good um, that uh, you guys will grow grow close you know being kind to a servant will, will, will cause him to be like a son to you like an heir he'll, he'll you know your relationship will grow um, a little bit hard to know which one um, but I think both of those translations have something good to say, so I'll leave it to you guys to wrestle with. Verse 22, a man of wrath uh, stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. Notice that causes much transgression, not just by himself, but by others too. Angry people just kind of cause tiffs. In fact, there was a situation with um, a member that was uh, part of a youth group, uh, Jack knows what I'm talking about, uh, that, long story short, there was a... Um, an incident that was recorded on camera, and in the camera, th this other person was um, instigating what was going on. So I mean, that's kind of what this is talking about. A person. Uh, let me read it. Read it again. Um, one, and one given to anger causes much transgression. Okay. Have you ever watched movies like Braveheart, and they give like their speeches yeah. and stuff, and you're like, "Let's do this." Yeah. And you just felt pumped. Yeah. You know. Well, it's kind of like that. Um, one uh, verse twenty-three. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Here we have a little bit of a uh, what is it called? A conundrum, a paradox. Uh, so a pride will cause you to be uh, humiliated in life, you know. But then, if you're lowly in spirit or you're humble, people will treat you with, with honor. <laughs> See, it doesn't really it doesn't really fit. You think well, lowly people they're lowly, but lowly people will be respected more. So. Uh, verse 24 then the partner of a thief thief hates his own life 
He hears the curse but discloses nothing. And the idea here is that when you align yourself with people who are doing the wrong thing, it becomes a trap for yourself. Not when you join with those kinds of people, um, you 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 learn to um, to hate yourself in a sense. It, it's a it's a how would you? I'm trying to think of a different way to say this. Um, no, it, it's a situation that, you, that you're going to get bound in because what's going to happen is that person's going to wind up with the curse. They're going to get um, you know either people cursing them or they're going to get uh, caught in judgment or whatever because they can't come clean because they're also in it. They're going to get sucked, in, sucked into that as well, um, which is why it says here, he hears a cur uh, the curse but discloses nothing. He's trapped. He can't get out of the situation. Verse 25, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And pastors talked about this one uh, for a while. And this is not a basis for living life for yourself. Oftentimes people quote this verse and say, that's why I just you know do whatever I'm going to do. Well, this isn't saying go and be self-centered. That's not what he's saying at all. He's just simply saying that when your primary concern is the fear of man, it's not you're gonna you're gonna act differently. You're gonna do different things to try and impress them. You see, high schoolers do this all the time. But when whoever trusts the Lord is safe, see what I mean? So uh, verse uh, twenty-six may seek the face of a ruler, but it is from the Lord that a man gets justice. Now this is really really a neat a neat verse here. And this applies to more than just justice, right? Many seek the face of a doctor, but it is from God that man gets healing. Many seek the face of a banker, but it is from the Lord that one gets wealth. See what I mean? It, it, it kind of it, it kind of applies to, to many different things there. Um, and the idea here isn't it's not saying this. Don't seek justice; only pray about it. Don't seek bettering yourself, only pray about it. He's not saying that at all. He's saying ultimately God is in control. We need to go to God with things and trust in God, in God with things. Not in the ruler, not in the banker, not in this, not in that, not in anybody. See what I mean? We need to trust in God. We don't trust in people, we trust in God. The Gospel of John says this, Jesus didn't need people to validate him. He didn't need people to, to um, what is he, what's the word that he says, um, to give him praise. Because he he knew you know his role he knew who God was he knew he who he was he didn't need people to validate him and that's kind of the idea with this too we don't need people you know we don't, we don't need to trust in people for things but we still do need to go to the doctor and that kind of stuff we we are still expected to pay our taxes we are still expected to go to court with things we are still expected about those kinds of things okay so <clears throat> verse twenty seven an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous. And this is what I was talking about. But one whose way is straight is an abomination to the wicked. Wicked people hate righteous people. And righteous people hate wicked people. Well, I should say their ways. Um, so, any questions on that? So, uh, I want to go back to that one verse, though, um, where it says, By mere words the servant is not disciplined, in verse 19, is not condoning beating employees. Mm -hmm. It's not condoning beating people. It's commenting on the benefits of practice at that time. That's how it was done, and there were pre and there were po positive effects of it. Um, so I want to kind of keep things. Whoa. Okay. Um, everybody good on that? We're going to go to Proverbs 30. Okay, cool. So this takes us to the words of Agur. Now, there's actually a few different um, readings of this first, first part. The ESV says this. The words of Agur, son of Jekka, the oracle. And then it goes to the first thing. Whereas, uh, there's also a variant reading. Uh, if you have an NIV, it'll probably have this, uh, as well as some other translations. Agur, son of Jekka, an oracle, this man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel, and to Ukul. Yeah. Is yours to that? Yeah. Um, it's possible that what it is saying is this guy, Agur, had this oracle, this teaching, that he then told to for two people, Ithiel and Ukul. Okay? Kind of like the beginning of Acts, uh, or Luke and Acts, actually. Um, Luke writes to Theophilus, whoever that is. See what I mean? Kind of like, kind of like that. But then, um, there's, it's also possible that it starts like this. The words of Agur, son of Jacob, the oracle, the man declares, I am weary, O God, I am weary, O God, and worn out. Both translations are possible. 
and it's hard to know. This one really fits in. I'm really good and worn out. That one, that it fits with what he's about to say. But so does the intro of the other one, like like your Bible has. This man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel, and to Ukul. It could be an introduction, just saying who he get, who he told it to, or it could be um. Because watch, we're gonna go on and I'll and I'll kind of explain here. Surely I'm too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not heard, learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. See, so it kind of fits in there. I'm worried and worn out. I I, I don't have the, this wisdom, and and I you know I'm just worn out. You know, so it kind of fits with it. I, I I found myself lacking. I'm seeking but not finding. I'm 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 I'm, I'm lacking. So yeah, that kind of fits. But it also fits if he's saying this is what I said to these two people. See, so we're kind of left this, uh, with this irritating, um, irritating thing. So, <coughs> so verse 1 through 3, he's not a wise person. Now, if you remember two weeks ago or three weeks ago or something like that, we, it was a couple weeks ago, we talked about um, what you do when, you, when, you're, when you've lived your life as a fool the whole time and you turn. Well, this is a perfect example of that. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. So he actually says two different things here. First off, I have not the understanding of a man. I'm like a wild animal, is what he's saying. But then he says here, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. So there he's saying, I'm less. I, I, I'm falling short of God's standard of knowledge here. So that statement I think we would all agree with. But then this first statement, you can really see how, how much he's, I guess you could say, prostrating himself, that... I'm like a wild beast with my knowledge. I'm 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 a foolish animal, you know. Um, so, <clears throat> verse four: Who has ascended to heaven? Now, okay. Now, verse four. Let me just kind of preface this with this. He's talking about two different things. One, he's talking about something that God has done, but he's also comparing himself to what man cannot do. Okay. So let's see at first is what man cannot do. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Well, no man has done that. Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Well, you can't gather wind in your fist. It goes right through your hand. Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Have you ever tried to put water in a garment? It leaks through. You can't. Uh, who has established all the ends of the earth? Who, who, has, who has been able to make the earth? What person has been able to even conquer the earth? Either way, you understand that. Well, nobody's been able to do either of those things. Um... What is his name and what is, it, what is his son's name? Name Surely you know. If this person exists out there, surely he has a legacy of some kind because he truly is the most powerful, most wise of all people. So who is he? What's his son's name? Where's his legacy? He doesn't exist because that man doesn't exist. But also, this very much so points to God too. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Jesus. God did that. Also, God did that in the Garden of Eden and multiple times after that. See what I mean? God, it, God was able to do that. Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Well, the Bible says multiple different times, God has done that. Um, like the song Indescribable says, you know, from the highest of heights to the depths of the seas, done all these different things, you know. Um, and if you read uh, the book of Job, um, near the ending, God says a bunch of questions that are very much so like this. Um, so it, you can read that for yourself, though. Uh, who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who, who has wrapped up the garment? Well, God's done that. You know, he, he's, these things testify of what God has done. Who has established all the ends of the earth? God. What is his name and what is his son's name? See, this is a part of, of Proverbs that points forward to Jesus coming. Right. See how neat that is? He's talking about, you know, and, and I don't know if Agur knew that that's what he, he was prophesying here. I don't, I don't know if he knew that or not. It really doesn't tell us that. A lot, a lot of times the prophets didn't know the full extent of the prophecy. So keep that in mind. Um, is this he cannot compete with God or the wise Ver, uh, verse 5 through 6 every word of God proves true he is a shield to those who take refuge in him do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar now Deuteronomy also says do not add to the words that are written um, and I believe Revelation says too but I'm not positive it does? okay um, so uh, let's see here So there's a few things. First off, uh, pride of putting yourself in, in God's uh, in God's place. Oftentimes we do things, um, you know, kind of think. Let me give you an example. Before Moses received the law, there was a guy named um, Hammurabi of Babylon, and he made a law code 
you know, list of laws, and said that it came, it was given to him by the gods. A good example of this, that 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 pride of putting yourself in God's place. Look at my perfect law, which it should be noted that it, uh, things in Moses' law contrast specifically with Hammurabi's law. So I just think that that's kind of yeah. interesting. Um, okay, but then also there's a, a little bit more here. Um, thinking you are wise or spiritual enough to have it all figured out. Well, the Bible didn't really say this, but I think this is what it, what it probably means. And there's a difference between reading the Bible and drawing, drawing conclusions about things like marijuana because it's not in the Bible, or reading the Bible and then thinking that you are so spiritual that you know better than what the Bible says. Well, the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin, but I have this special understanding from God. See what I mean? Yeah. Putting yourself in that place, adding to the words, allowing exceptions to the rule. It's okay if I sleep around outside of marriage. It's all right. Not that big of a deal for me. You know, I can do these things and get... And we were, I just talked about this last Sunday night, actually, so... No reason, no reason to get too much into it. Uh, by the way, if you guys missed, um, you weren't there. You were there. You were there. Yeah, you were there. You weren't there. Um, it, Zach, uh, you missed uh, the, my second part of Spiritual Warfare. If you would like to still hear it, it is on Facebook. You can also get a CD recording of it if you want. Okay. Um, let's see, what else? I think that's all I wanted to mention from this part. And that part there is going to come back. I'm going to mention that again, that he is a shield to those who take refuge at the end of verse 5. So don't forget that. I'll come back to it, okay? Um, two things I ask of you, verse 7. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be fool and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and profane the name of my God. So he's saying a few different things here. But su you could summarize it as this. Not being deceitful or self-sufficient. If you're self-sufficient, you don't think you need God. If uh, you're deceitful, so I mean, you you um, like he says here, um, be poor and still and profane the name of the Lord. So um, remove far from me falsehood and lying, which is going to go back uh, reflect back on the profane on the uh, uh, being poor and stealing. Uh, but it also kind of implies more too. Uh, give me neither poverty nor riches. So, there's that. Any questions on that part? And that's just a really good, that's just a really good, that's just said from a really good place. You know what I mean? I really like that. Um, it's been one of my for a long time. Yeah, it's like, so much in Christianity of, of today, everything is all about what you can get, what you can grab, what you can get your hands on. And this is just so refreshing because it goes past that. You know what I mean? It just, goes past it. Don't give me so much that I don't think that I need you. But just give me enough so that I can get by. Just let me get by. See what I mean? And I think that's such a great place to be at where you're not so absorbed with material things. You don't have to have everything. But at the same time, you have what you need. You know, I, that's just such a great place to be at. Um, but were you going to say something, Zach? I don't want to cut uh, you off there. I was just remembering what was said uh, Sunday uh, um, Sunday school. Oh, I wasn't there for that. I, I mentioned that verse. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah Chuck mentions it. Yeah. Uh, has mentioned it quite a few times. And in fact, the funny thing is, is I barely even knew that it existed before Chuck mentioned it. But yeah. since then, you know, um, right. found out about it. So, and, and verses 1 through 9, this is basically what he's saying. His ignorance in verses 1 through 3 the security found in God, uh, I'm sorry, 1 through 4, I guess you could really say. The security found in God in verses 5 through 6. So it's 1 through 9 or 1 through 4? Well, in order. Oh, his okay. ignorance, security, and God protection from temptation. But if you want it more specific, his ignorance, 1 through 4. Uh, security in God, 5 through 6. And then protection from temptation, 7 through 9. Which is really, I think, a pretty good place to come from. You know, he he, he acknowledges his ignorance, his failings, and then he, um, you know, basically acknowledges his trust in God. Every word of God proves true. I'm standing in your word, God. And then he even says here, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So that's what I'm going to do. Right. Uh, but don't add to those words, lest you rebuke you and you be found a liar. Which transitions perfectly into verse 7 and 8 when he says, remove far from me falsehood and lying. So let me live by your words, basically, 
Let me only live by your words. Let me not add to your words. And let me be found standing in your truth. So really a, a great a great statement there. Which takes us to... Um, he starts going off into a bunch of different uh, specific things. Verse 10. Uh, Do not slander a servant to his master lest he curse you and you be, be held guilty. Um, and I want to kind of point this out. We talked a couple weeks ago about the way that curses, if they have no basis, they won't... You know, curses don't have power in and of themselves. Right. If a curse is based on something true, like for instance, um, somebody curses you because you've been been uh, mistreated the poor. Well, we know that those things are true, and God will will repay the person who's been poor, uh, mistreated the poor, especially when they cry out against you to God. God never does not does not hear. Yeah, I said that right. Um, so the curses do stick if they are true. And I think that that's something we need to pay attention here. Lest he curse you and you be held guilty. He curse you and it stick because you actually did do something wrong. But this goes more than just the sl uh, slandering a servant to his master. D this, but I just mentioned this in the last chapter. Don't talk bad about somebody to somebody else because it could blow up in your face. Remember that? <laughs> the perfect example of that. Um, so, verse 11, there are those <clears throat> who curse their fathers... And do not bless their mothers. There are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. There are those who, uh, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. There are those uh, whose teeth are swords, whose fingers are knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, the needy from among mankind. So let's kind of break up what these things mean. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. These are people who are just disrespectful to their parents. Now, believe it or not, but the Bible says about 50 gazillion times not to disrespect your parents. God really doesn't want you to disrespect your parents. He's even more lenient about you disrespecting authority in general than he is parents specifically. Which is a pretty big statement. Yeah. So, that's, you know, pretty rough there. Um... So cursing replies, I'm sorry, applies to insulting, treating, lighting, or disrespecting. That a cursing there in uh, in eleven. There are those who curse their fathers. It's it's kind of an umbrella term, not necessarily a direct curse. You know, curse you, damn you, that kind of stuff. It's not necessarily saying that specific cursing is is, is an umbrella for the different terms. And to insult them, to treat them lightly, to disrespect them, to, to not honor them in your heart, that kind of, it's, it's, a, it's an encompassing thing. And then Jesus made it even more difficult by talking about the things that are in our heart. So if you curse them in your heart, that counts too. <laughs> um, there are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. Now, he's not talking about people who take showers but are immoral in their hearts. <laughs> He's talking about people who pretend to be righteous, do all the right things, they, 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 they fulfill the religion, they fulfill the law perfectly. Pharisees, for instance. Um, but their hearts are far from God. They honor God with their lips, not their hearts. Verse uh, 13, there are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift, prideful people. In verse 14, there are those whose teeth are swords, and basically people who... Um, who are who destroy other people? They say mean things. They just they just don't care about how it hurts people. They cut them deep. Um, verse fifteen: The leech has two hours. Give and give. Three things are never satisfied. Four never say enough. Now, if you notice, he's adding up here. The leech, that's one, has two daughters. Give and give. Uh, three things are never satisfied. Four never say enough. So let's kind of emphasize that because there are not actually two daughters that we have to attribute special meaning to. The, the three and four things, one, two, three, four, that's just a way of writing in Hebrew wisdom literature, okay? There's not actually, is it one or is it two or is it three or is it four? Well, there's four things, but this is how they kind of build to it, okay? <laughs> if, that, if that makes sense. So, the leech has two daughters, give, give, give and give. Three things are never satisfied, four never say enough. And I really want to emphasize that because a lot of people get off basis of this. Sheol, the barren womb, the land never satisfied with water, and the fire that never says enough. So, um, a few things. <coughs> Sheol, for all intents and purposes, death. The grave. Death. Okay, keep it simple. Um, we could talk a lot more about where this, the different ideas that some people used Sheol for in the Bible. You know, the revelation of what death actually was. We're not going to get into that, any of that, though, tonight. We'll probably look at that next week. Um, but anyways, um, an idea here is life will not be happy for those who are never satisfied. 
Death of the Barren Womb. This is somebody who's unable to conceive. If you've known somebody like this, when they re it becomes an all-consuming all uh, desire for them. They're always, you know... Exactly like Hannah in the Bible. First uh, Samuel is like chapter 1, I think. Um, Hannah, you know, is the same... This guy has two wives, and one, is, one of his wives just can't have kids. And uh, it's just... It's just a complete bitter thing for her. And and the husband, what is it the women down here say, bless his heart, uh, was trying to comfort her by saying, am I not enough for you? <laughs> but it didn't really work. <laughs> and she was still sad in her heart. Uh, but luckily God did hear her. And, uh, you know, it's a good thing that the other wife made fun of Hannah. Because that just, um, you know, when God sees people being mistreated, he'll oftentimes do things to reverse the role. Right. So if she hadn't made fun of Hannah, Hannah might never have conceived. Right. That's just something, and if Hannah had never complained to God about it. Right. Keep that in mind, guys. Huh. Keep that in mind. Uh, anyways, the land never satisfied with water. This is, have you ever had really stubborn soil? You do everything you can, you just can't get anything to grow there. Yeah. You just can't get anything to grow there. That's what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I just threw water in my yard and there's grass. <laughs> um, say what? That's my house. <laughs> Here comes the weeds. <laughs> uh, and the fire that never says enough. Uh, for those of you who remember the Rudoso fire a couple years ago, this is a great example of that. It just burned everything. Um, so was I going to say anything about that? God will bring severe punishment for disrespect of parents. Did I say that? That's not yet. Okay. We're going to 17. Uh, the eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. There we go. God will bring severe punishment for disrespect of parents. So, there you go. Now, if you notice here, there's a contrast here. The eye that mocks a father contrasts with will be picked out by ravens of the valley. Um, uh, yeah. Pretty rough there. And so it is definitely imagery. He's not necessarily saying that if you... Scorn your father, God's going to lead you out to the desert right before you die, and a bird's going to find you there and pluck it out. That's not what he's saying. It's the idea of severe punishment awaits those who, who scorn their parents. So, <coughs> Well, you'd be surprised how many people misunderstand poetic... Yeah. And it, think things poetical is nice, and, 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 and it sounds real cool and everything, but sometimes people just... Woo, like, for instance, uh, I'm not saying whether there is or isn't a mark of the beast, okay? I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that there's only one passage in the whole Bible that I know of where it specifically mentions the mark of the beast. And it's very obscure. It could not be a literal thing. It's very possible that it's just saying those people who uh, serve the intents and purposes of the Antichrist. Yeah. We might be spending all this time... <laughs> Looking for, the mark. Looking for the mark of the beast when there is no physical, actual, literal mark of the beast. Right. And there actually is basis for that, too, because it talks about um, God still putting his mark on people's uh, heads and hearts and stuff. Yeah. Well, God's not really going to have a thing of ink that he's going to stamp <laughs> us with. It, sa it says in Jeremiah, for instance, that it'll, it's in our heart. It's something that God's placed in our heart, which we have now. The law is imprinted on our hearts, is what Jeremiah says. Well, I don't remember God opening my chest and stamping me with something in my heart. Right. But yet inside of me, there's the Holy Spirit. Inside of me, there, God's, God reveals his words to me. And as I study, he speaks to me, right? And as Christians, that's what he does. Well, that's not a literal mark that I have on my heart. Right. So there is a possibility that it couldn't, that it's not necessarily. And the thing about Revelations is, a lot of it is poetical. A lot of it is poetical. Yeah. When Satan is thrown out of heaven in chapter 12, it calls him a dragon. Yeah. But we know that he's an angel. Well, is an angel or is your dragon? Well, is an angel, but it's symbolic. It's 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 poetic. Yeah, and and so you really can't take things in Revelations, especially as overly literal, because that type of literature is called apocalyptic, and and we have other non-biblical uh, books or letters or whatever you want to call them that are apocalyptic, and we can compare it and know that you know that's just not how they don't say things literal in apocalyptic literature. They just don't. So let's not get too worried and concerned about different things. But with that being said, slight little addendum there. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to let a government mark you in any way with chips or anything like that. Because no. if people keep tabs of you, that's a good way of taking away your freedom. Yeah. There was these certain people called the Nazis who did it to the Jews. And it didn't work out too well for them. No. You know. Uh, so just that might not be the best idea to let a government do that to you. However, um, not necessarily the mark of the beast. So let's not get... Real scared. Um, 
But anyways. <laughs> yeah, there is. In fact, uh, what, uh, uh, Christians, you know, Christians are known for spreading fear. <laughs> like, there is these little things that they put into people for diabetes. Um, I, I don't know exactly what it does. Yeah, yeah but it's not even really a ship. Monitor yeah, it's a, it's like it's almost like um, it's I would compare it to the, when people have the heart thing and they have the you had one um, pacemaker. I would compare it to like a pacemaker, just something that, that monitors your body, keeps keeps it stay on course, that kind of stuff. And they posted a lot of stuff about how it was the mark of the beast and stuff. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> please stop, guys, <laughs> please stop. <laughs> uh, you know, Christians shouldn't be known for spreading fear. No. Which is going to be extremely hard because at the longer we live, there are going to be hard times. Jesus promises this. Yeah. He promises that there's going to be scary times ahead of us. And it's been the end times ever since Jesus was resurrected. Okay? It seems like back in like the, the 90s, all preachers wanted to do was scare people. Honestly, wow. yes. Yeah. And there's the thing that I'm getting at is we don't need to... We don't need to our, our first response to news shouldn't be fear. Right. You understand what I'm saying? We don't have to be afraid when we get news. Like the, like the thing with North Korea uh, almost bombing Japan. It's okay. It's all right. God's got things under control. Yeah. Some people die through war. Yes, that is a thing that happens. But God will keep the earth going until it's his time. Right. See what I mean? There is no person ever that is going to be able to, to destroy the earth before God himself destroys it. Right. This is not going to happen. Right. You know? He promised in his word, I will continue the cycles of the earth. The sun and the moon and the wind and the winter and the harvest, all these things, I will continue until the end. Yeah. He gave his word. Yeah. We don't have to be concerned about those kinds of things because uh -huh. he made a promise. And he who makes a promise will see it through. Right. Unless, of course, God doesn't exist, but then it doesn't really matter anyways, now does it? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways. Um, I guess that takes us to verse 18. Three things are too wonderful for me. Four I do not understand. Now, what he's saying here are things that are really cool. Awesome. Okay. The first thing is the way of an eagle in the sky. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> uh, in fact, I have it written down right here. Amazing things. Okay. The second amazing thing is the way of a serpent on a rock. Now, notice how it goes from the sky to the land to water. Okay. So the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, there's a land, and the way of a ship on the high seas, there's a water, and the way of a man with a virgin. Now, obviously, he's talking about the purity of, of, of unity between two people. And yes, he's talking about sex. He is talking That's about sex. gross. That's gross. <laughs> Somebody should have told him we don't talk about sex. No, they didn't. Grandpa never had sex. Mom never had sex. No. Okay? All those people never had sex. <laughs> you know, there was a time when the church was known for not being able to give answers about sexual things. I hope that that never happens again. I really do. Because people are going to... People are curious. And they're going to find answers somewhere. I'd rather it be from the church with a biblical view than out there in the world, you know? <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Um, it's like money. People shouldn't have to learn about money from a bank. Well, I got a credit card and then I got myself really in debt, so I found out the hard way. Well, they shouldn't have to. The church should be able to disciple people in those areas too, which is why I'm so so proud of Pastor's main focus here at the church, because he doesn't focus about just telling people head knowledge. He focuses about res um, what's the word? responsibility. Right. What's that? Uh, he focuses about how you can take those principles from the Bible and apply it. In fact, one time he made this comment, which was way taken out of context by some people. He said, knowing that there's a trinity doesn't ultimately matter if it doesn't change your life. And people really blew a casket. They're like, it is important to know about the trinity. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not saying that, that at all. Yes, it, it is important to know about the trinity and that kind of stuff. His point was this, and let me reword it so that you, people don't crucify him all over again. He was just saying, if, you, if all you have is a bunch of knowledge, that makes you an encyclopedia. But if that knowledge moves you to action, that makes you a disciple of Christ. That makes you a disciple of Christ. If your knowledge of what the Word says is what pushes you to love your neighbors and your enemies and those people, if your knowledge of the Word is what causes you to love love people, if it, to serve people, to do things like the food pantry, then that that's good. But if all you have is a bunch of head knowledge, then that does nothing. 
God doesn't care if you know if you may have every word of the Bible memorized, but that it's in your heart. See what I mean? In fact, there's a lot of people in Israel, for instance, who have the law memorized, but they still live under the bondage of religion. So that shows that it's not it's not all about that. Um, so I guess it takes us to. Um, verse 20, this is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. Immoral people excuse immorality. Eats, wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. Under th In fact, oftentimes you'll hear people like this, I didn't cause, cause that divorce. It was already there when I got there. You hear people say it like that a lot. I have done no wrong. Excusing themselves from the fact that what they did was wrong. But it was wrong. You guys see watch South Park? It, it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, verse 21. Under three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot bear up. Now these are things that are just they don't fit. They're not that they're not right to happen. The first, a slave when he becomes a king, a fool when he is filled with food, an unloved woman when she gives gets a husband, and a maidservant when she dis, dis, uh, displaces her mistress. Now let me kind of make these things easier. A slave when he becomes king. Because a slave is not accustomed to leadership. He doesn't know how to lead. So oftentimes, if you guys have ever read uh, The Animal Farm by George Orwell, it's the idea of the role reversal. Like the prince and the pauper. Like the prince and the pauper. Yeah. Oftentimes, there'll be a bad... Uh, it just won't work. Um, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not good. They haven't earned that position, first off. But then also, they're not used to it. They don't know how to, how to do that. Uh, next... Uh, a fool when he is filled with food. Now, this is a bad thing, too, because a fool remains unchanged, but yet his needs are provided for him. Whereas the Bible makes it clear that people, when they are faced with need, that's how God shows them their need to change. So if you remove that from God, you have taken the place of God, and you have not just incurred further wrath on the fool, but incurred wrath on yourself. See what I mean? You're, you're, you're trying to override God's ways. But then also, he's undeserving of the food. He has, like Paul says in, I think it's like first or second Thessalonians, he says, if, if they don't eat, they shouldn't, if they don't work, they shouldn't eat. You know, he's not saying don't care for the poor people. He's saying people who are just lazy, who aren't, who they could take care of things. They're just not. Have you ever gone on a missions trip with somebody who all they do is sit back and, and do nothing while everyone else is, is trying to work together to do the skits and do all that stuff? Well, you know, they're, they're in charge of the Instagram photos. No, but honestly, it's like, okay, take right. the pictures, great. <laughs> Fantastic, but do other stuff too. I mean, this thing's really heavy. If you could just help me carry it, were you gonna say something? Because it looked like you were raising your hand. No, okay. Um, so a fool is undeserving and remains unchanging. Notice it doesn't say a fool who used to, somebody who used to be a fool. And then verse twenty-three: an unloved woman when she gets a husband. The idea here is um, someone who is married but hated. The husband doesn't truly love her. It's a terrible thing when somebody gets married. Um, and, the, and the person who married them doesn't really love them. A good example of this is uh, is uh, Jacob and Leah. Uh, in the Bible, Jacob, uh, uh, who was later called Israel, uh, wants to marry this girl, um, Rachel. And I was going to say Rebecca, and I was like, nope, that was his mom. <laughs> uh, wants to marry this girl named Rachel, uh, and he works seven years to, to marry her, and the father fools him into marrying her, for all intents and purposes, her ugly sister Leah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been speculated she, she really wasn't. Lies. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been speculated that she wasn't really ugly. I don't really care. I'm not really getting into that. The thing, I, the thing that's important here is that Jacob didn't love her, right. and because Jacob didn't love her, God blessed her more than Rachel. <laughs> she had more kids. It specifically says God saw that that Jacob didn't like her, mm -hmm. and so she became pregnant. And then Leah said, surely now my husband w will love me. And she did this four times till she finally reached Judah. She had uh, Reuben, uh, Simeon, Levi, and then finally she had Judah, and Judah's name means to praise. And so she said, finally I'm just going to rejoice in you, God, because clearly Jacob's a lost cause. He's not going to love me. <laughs> At least you do, so great are you, Judah. <laughs> you know see what I mean? <laughs> right. So then she ends up having more kids after that, but you get the idea there. Um so a, a woman who's married but, but hated, um, and then a maid servant. And it says here, and a maid servant when she displaces her mistress. To displace means to leave, or to abandon. Um, she a maid servant who leaves her mistress doesn't do what is her job. Right, doesn't do what she what her job is. A good example of this is in uh, Genesis. 
uh, there, Abraham's uh, wife Sarah has this uh, servant. Her name is starts with an H. Hagar. Hagar, yes. <laughs> and she actually gets displaced once by her by herself. She just gets upset and leaves. And God tells her to go back. And the second time, Sarah and Abraham tell her to go. Uh, you can read about it there in Genesis, probably like around chapter 20 somewhere. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Okay. So these things are not good. Um, Four things on earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. No, there's somewhere in here where it says stately. Where did I write that down? Okay, I remember where that is. Okay. Yeah. Four things on earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. And that one's pretty simple to understand there. Uh, that ants are out during, su during summer and get everything, but then you don't see them all winter long. They don't work at all during the winter. Uh, the rock badges are people not mighty, yet they make their homes in the, in the cliffs. Mighty places to keep them safe. Um, 27. The locusts have no king, yet all of them march in rank. Have you ever been in a field covered with locusts? Whew. Buddy. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Uh, verse 28, the lizard you can take in your hands, yet it is in king's palaces. These are tiny little animals, but they're, they're able to accomplish these great things. They're, these things are on earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. So verse 29, three things are stately in their tread. Now, stately means grand or noble. Okay, Three things are, are grand in their tread. Four things are, 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 are great in their stride. The lion, which is mightiest among beasts, and does not turn back before any. Uh, verse 31, he's going to go through a, a few things rapidly. The lion is the only one that really gets that special treatment of the extra long um, elaboration. The strutting rooster, which if you've ever had chickens, you know what that's talking about. They're a walk around like they've got, they, they're just... Bad. They got yeah, they're bad. They, they got stuff all figured out. Yeah. Roosters are the most arrogant of all animals. Let me tell you that. <laughs> at least the lion has a reason to. Hey, Gracie, can you unlock the door for Ben? At least the uh, at least the uh, uh, the lion has a reason to. He's got that roar and everything. Right. But a rooster is a. <laughs> That's it. I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, the he goat, and a king whose army is with him. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> And the idea here is obvious because the army is able to help them squash rebellions. Yeah. But, but you know, uh, you know, like people say, oh, you're real big and bad with all your friends. Right. <laughs> Anyways, um, <clears throat> so there's that. Verse 32: If you have been foolish, exalting yourself, or if you have been devising evil, so either a fool or a wicked person, put your hand on your mouth. Stop it. <laughs> For pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. So humility and righteousness produce peace and harmony, in contrast with stirring stuff up produces quarrels. Notice what he says there. For pressing milk produces curds. Stop stop your foolishness and stop your stop your wickedness, because it's going to produce quarrels. Pressing anger produces strife. Um, Done through pride and weakness. So here's a scale of what that basically look like. Looks like quarrels uh, uh, lead uh, are from pride and wickedness, and peace is from humility. And, uh, I'm sorry, wickedness. Quarrels are from pride and wickedness. I said that wrong. Uh, and peace is from humility and righteousness. So just a little, a little contrast to help you understand what it's saying here, which I think is is really a great way to end the end the book of Proverbs here with these different things because, you know, I mean honestly, let's look at it with the eyes back then. You had women weren't necessarily. Let's just say women weren't as as treated well as, as men. Let's just let's just leave it at that. And I'm gonna leave, you know just so the whole book he's been telling men how to act, with occasional warnings about bad women. Okay, bad women, constant dripping, guys, constant dripping. Uh, <laughs> and then he. Uh, and then he, and then you know his, his things end, and and Agar has his words here, and it, t it directly addresses something Solomon has talked about the whole way through, a fool who's finding wisdom. Agar is the fool who's finding wisdom. What a great way to end the book. And then uh, Lemuel's going to going to say something that's going to contrast with, with some of the things that Solomon said. Really gives a good balance. And then it closes the book by saying, well, what about women? And it talks about women with great respect, 
It talks about women, women with great purpose. Just a great way to end the book of Proverbs. Now, nowadays, the culture has changed. So we miss a lot of the importance of that. See, back then, that was a fantastic way for Hezekiah's scribes to show that God had more in mind for women than what a lot of people were seeing in women. Nothing more than how I'm going to get conceive children. Nothing more than, see what I mean? It, it really gave women the idea that you have a purpose. You, you are worthy of honor and respect as a mom and as a woman and as a, as a wife, as a daughter. It's just really great things. Um, so anyways, how, since our culture has changed, um, but really the whole book of Proverbs applies to men and women. Now, I mean, obviously it was written for men more or so then, except for the last of Proverbs 31, but now it pretty much applies uh, to everyone, at least in America. So, um, the question of the week, I mean, yeah, of the week, uh, is it okay to give marijuana to those who are dying of cancer? What you guys to genuinely think about this? A lot of people are opposed to marijuana. What about in the case of someone who is uh, going through the painful process of, of, of cancer that, they, that there's no cure for, that they are dying of, okay? Um, so just be thinking about this. And I want you guys to genuinely um, genuinely shake, shake yourself on this, okay? Don't just simply parrot out an answer because that's what you want to believe. Read chapter 31 of Proverbs and then think about it, okay? Because this directly addresses with chapter, chapter 31 of Proverbs. So you're going to have to address it with drinking in 31, and it applies to marijuana nowadays. So, um, Okay, any questions or comments? No? Okay.